Brian Kelly with us. He's the Secretary of the California State Transportation Agency. And some of you may not know, it's a newer agency um, set up at the top of the sort of the pyramid above Caltrans and above the California High Speed Rail Authority. So you'll hear more about the uh, setup and the purpose and everything. Uh, Brian Kelly was sworn in as the first secretary of the new California State Transportation Agency, which has replaced the Business Transportation and Housing Agency with a new agency focused solely on transportation. Kelly had previously been running BT and H since March of 2012 when Governor Brown appointed him to lead the new agency. As, secretary, as acting secretary, he oversaw 12 departments and several economic development programs and commissions consisting of more than 45,000 employees and a budget of $18 billion, a budget larger than most states in the nation. The new Cal State portfolio remains one of the largest in the state of California. Its operations address the myriad transportation issues that directly impact the state's economic vitality and quality of life, including public safety, construction and maintenance, and inner city and high-speed rail. Kelly has been at the center of, the, of most of the major transportation policy decisions in the state of California for the past decade and a half, having served as chief transportation policy consultant for four su successive Senate president pro temporis. Kelly was executive staff director for Senate President Pro Tempore Daryl Steinberg since 2008. Previously, he was a principal consultant for the Senate President Pro Tempore Pet, Pet, Peretta in 2004 to 2008 and principal consultant um, for an additional one in 98 to 2004. So with that, please welcome Brian Kelly. Well, good morning. <clears throat> Thank you so much. It's a nice introduction, and whenever I hear a lengthy introduction like that, especially when it recounts my 21-year career in Sacramento, I always thank God when I started, I had a full head of hair. And it was seemed so easy then. Uh, tough business, got that right. Oh, well, good morning, and welcome to the second day uh, of the U.S. High Speed Rail Association Conference. Uh, it is a true pleasure to be down uh, down here in Southern California with you all. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit about uh, some of the broad challenges we have in transportation in California and how the high-speed rail project um, is sort of at the heart of our strategy of dealing with, with those challenges. Um, so first, I'm, I'm going to sort of state the obvious, but you know, it, it is that California's transportation system is really at a crossroads and in a period of of great transformation. Uh, there's a lot going on on the technology side in, in California. Cleaner cars, uh, cleaner technologies for trucks, for buses, uh, and I think a public that is demanding more and more choice in how they get around. Uh, that's a fortunate coincidence of events because uh, what we as policymakers then struggle to do is, is try to make sense of all of this and, and meet the demands of the public with the opportunities and the technologies at our disposal so that we're providing a transportation system that people in California can use uh, and that will meet our policy objectives uh, in this state. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, those challenges. You know, never before it's been, has our transportation system been asked to deliver so much to so many. California policy today requires the state's transportation system to deliver on mobility, on safety, on economic, on accessibility, and on environmental objectives. And that's really always been the case in transportation, but mainly the environmental objectives in the era of climate change uh, have gotten more challenging and uh, more difficult and a more acute challenge presented uh, to transportation. So while our system must continue to meet the demands for reliable travel, uh, it, all, it, it must also achieve quantifiable re reductions in greenhouse gas emissions in California. The state is committed to working with its regional and local partners to deliver a transportation system capable of meeting all of today's transportation objectives. Fortunately, the path to doing so can be achieved while providing California with what they with, I should say, providing Californians with what they want most, and that is greater mobility choices. So we're lucky, really. Uh, congestion in this state uh, has California seeking other has Californians seeking other ways to get around. 
Uh, they're calling for greater choice, and really their timing couldn't be better. They want choice, and we need to meet a greater set of objectives uh, on the environmental side in our transportation uh, community. So while Californians continue to display their want to drive their cars, and in this state, uh, in 2013, they piled up about 330 billion vehicle miles traveled, Californians still abhorred congestion and delay and traffic, and therefore they want alternatives. Household surveys conducted by the California Department of Transportation reflect a considerable increase in Californians diversifying their mode of travel. More are walking, more are biking, and more are trying public transit. They are seeking alternatives to driving, probably because they're tired of sitting in the mammoth congestion that we have in California. For more than 30 years, California's major urban areas, LA Basin, San Diego, the Bay Area, the Central Valley, and increasingly the Inland Empire, have occupied the list of the nation's most congested regions. While local, state, and federal governments have poured billions of dollars into improving our roads and freeways to accommodate growth, congestion remains as vexing a problem today uh, as it was decades ago. And perhaps it's time, we think it's time, for another way to combat that problem. Data tells us that congestion cannot be solved in any lasting way by simply adding more lanes of highways and roads. Such a strategy is not enough. It must be coupled with new approaches that look less at specific projects and more at improving corridors, that look less at analyzing how many cars we can squeeze through a segment of highway and instead look at how we can reliably move people to their destinations. Highway and road improvements alone will neither solve our congestion problems nor provide the mobility options that Californians seek. Fortunately, regions throughout the state are more and more taking on that corridor's approach. I just left Riverside County the other day and I saw a presentation on improvements they're making in the I-215 corridor. And while that includes uh, roadway improvements like uh, expanded HOV lanes and closing an HOV lane gap, uh, they're also expanding rail opportunities through that same corridor with the expansion uh, of the Metrolink service out in that area. So again, in a very congested corridor, it's not just about expanding roadway but providing other mobility uh, choices to Californians. We see this also in the I-5 uh, North uh, section in San Diego where they're expanding roadway, but they're also going to expand uh, the number of commuter rail uh, services that go through that area, also make bike and pedestrian alternatives available in the region. Um, we're seeking more and more of that kind of approach, that, that corridor approach instead of a specific project by project approach. So it's time for this new uh, strategy in California. At the center of this shift for us is also uh, California's high-speed rail as a new mobility choice. Um, rather than hours in a car or on the tarmac, uh, because, waiting in the car or on the tarmac because of a delayed flight, Californians will have an opportunity to benefit hugely from electrified high-speed rail as a choice for inter-regional travel. You know, I was fortunate to ride high-speed rail on a trip to Spain. I see my friend here from Spain. Uh, uh, you know, that experience for me was profound. Um, in California, high-speed rail remains too much of a concept and an abstract concept because we're not experiencing it. But where you can experience, it's a, it's, it's a meaningful uh, uh, opportunity to see how we can move and the potential for moving people between destination cities in this state. Uh, I'll just report to you that on the train ride I took in Spain, um, the commitment from the rail operator was that we would leave at 8 o'clock a.m. Uh, and if we were more than five minutes late, they had a policy of refunding your ticket. Um, guess what time we left? 8 a.m. <laughs> so we left at 8 a.m. We traveled the equivalent of about 300 miles, 325 miles, and we accomplished it in two hours and 20 minutes. And when I think about passenger rail in California today, that really says a lot. Uh, we have a once-a-day passenger rail service that somebody can take from the LA Basin to the Bay Area, and that ride takes between 11 and 12 hours today. And we think that's embarrassing. We think we can do a lot better, and I've experienced a lot better, and I think Californians deserve a lot better. And I would also say that to achieve our policy objectives, we need to provide that kind of an option. So it's the, the backbone, um, fortunately for high-speed rail, is already taking shape uh, as we move forward on that project. 
You know, in the Central Valley, right of way is being cleared. Vertical construction is already visible in Madera County. Highway realignments are fast approaching and old infrastructure is being dismantled and replaced to accommodate the coming train. I think the promise of high-speed rail is becoming a reality in California. And we need to help realize the transformative potential of high-speed rail with more than just investment in that system. We also must invest in those systems that connect with high-speed rail. This administration has focused on supporting many other inner city rail and transit projects around the state to help advance commuter options and seamlessly connect high-speed rail with local and regional transit services. We have existing commuter inner city rail services that can be improved, extended, and expanded to better address the state's mobility needs, and we have new funding we are using to build partnerships with the state's regions to achieve the goals of rail modernization and more integrated statewide public transportation system. The Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program is the State Transportation Agency's contribution to this effort. We're allowing the state, we are using these funds to pursue transformative investments that integrate and modernize the state's rail and public transit infrastructure. Last year, we put out about 224 million in these grants. Uh, it's the first year, the first round of grants from this source. And we awarded it to 14 projects around the state of California. All promising projects, including a new commuter service in the North Bay in the Bay Area, uh, clean vehicles for the Metrolink service down here, a new expanded and easier access to uh, Rosa Parks Willowbrook Station uh, here in Los Angeles. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a rewarding program, and those investments, I must say, are an important part of our overall rail modernization strategy. It's not so much about just building this fast train from the north to the south. We're trying to make a m more meaningful and profound investment in modernizing uh, transportation and public transit in California, particularly rail. So from expanding light rail services to increased service using zero emission buses, buses in the Antelope Valley uh, area and faster travel times on California's Capital Corridor and Altamont Corridor Express, uh, these investments will give Californians new choices of mobility. This law that created this program requires my agency to award 10% uh, of future cap and trade auction pro programs to these projects or to these important investments. We look forward to awarding funds to transformative projects across the state, delivering increased public transportation ridership and significant advantages and in investments to disadvantaged communities. The next round of the program will take place in 2016 with selected projects announced in August. And then, due to a law change this year, uh, the, the program will shift and will become a five-year uh, uh, long-term program where we will probably be identifying a few major transformative projects in California that the state will put a five-year uh, commitment toward. And um, that's an exciting prospect for me. I, I think it's sort of akin to the federal uh, full funding grant agreement where the state of California will help invest in major transformative rail and public transit projects over a longer term uh, period. So our transportation sector here in California in addition to having to meet the mobility and reliability needs of the public, uh, it also is responsible today for 37% of our collective carbon footprint. Uh, we have more emissions of greenhouse gases in this sector than any other sector in California. Any serious attempt to combat climate change must dramatically change how we move around uh, in our state and our communities. Diversifying the choices Californians have for mobility by introducing new and cleaner modes allows us to balance the demands on the system with our responsibility to our environment. In recent years, the Brown administration and the legislature have taken steps toward diversifying this transportation system, providing the mobility choices increasingly sought by Californians and investing in areas consistent with regional transportation plans and striving to get state transportation assets in a good state of repair. This important work continues and uh, it will continue uh, in the new year. You can expect the administration will continue to push for such investment as 2015 turns into 2016 and we'll need your collective help to get this done. So this is California. It's a very diverse and complex state requiring creative solutions to our most daunting challenges. Uh, for us, high-speed rail and the promise of that project is at the heart 
of our strategy to provide new mobility choices to Californians while meeting our environmental objectives. So I look forward to working with all of you in the future as we continue down this path, and I thank you very much for the time this morning. Thank you. All right, well, you've heard the great vision from the state level and from a city level, and so that's the kind of vision we need to help spread across the rest of the United States. Do we probably have time for maybe one or two questions? Um, anybody? David has a question. The mic's coming. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, of, uh, Caltrain, how much have you taken into consideration uh, the advent of uh, driverless autonomous cars? And ju just a quick clarification from the mayor. Do you have an existing 500 foot right away from Victorville to Palmdale? No, it's the design criteria or the high desert corridor. We will. Okay. We will. Okay. Can you restate the question? I'm sorry, on the yeah, autonomous yeah, uh, vehicles? Yeah, autonomous vehicles. In your state uh, highway transportation plan, what consideration have yeah. you made for the advent of driverless autonomous cars? Well, you know, I've got, as was mentioned, our structure here in, in California. My agency oversees several different departments, and it, it really falls into a couple when it comes to autonomous vehicles. Uh, Caltrans is uh, constantly uh, looking at uh, the, the infrastructure itself, what's uh, in the concrete, what needs to be in the concrete to allow uh, vehicles to communicate with infrastructure like they never have before. And they're developing strategies to, to deal with that as we go forward and, and, and produce that. I think the more important thing that you're going to hear a lot more about in the very short uh, term future here is uh, the regulations that are coming out of my other department the Department of Motor Vehicles, which, you know, in California today, we, are, we have authorized autonomous vehicles to be tested on our roadways. Our next challenge is to do regulations to allow them to actually operate on our roadways. And uh, we are, you're probably going to hear before this month ends a, uh, uh, a proposal on that and uh, the beginning of workshops in January uh, to move through that proposal so that we can lay out what that landscape looks like. So we're working hard on that. Yeah, you know, Secretary Kelly, don't, I've got a question for you. First of all, I'm glad to see you here, and I'm going to be looking to see you in March in Bakersfield. <laughs> okay, now my question is this. Uh, two questions. I know there's some efforts underway in the legislature to move the cap-and-trade money away from high-speed rail to other transportation projects of the need. Is that a real concern that we need to be concerned about to mobilize our folks to, uh, to stop that movement? And then the last question is the cap-and-trade money for transportation uh, I believe it's 25 or 50 percent of that money is supposed to go to disadvantaged communities. What are you doing to make sure that the communities of uh, disadvantaged communities are engaged in the process, how that money is going to be allocated, and where is that money is being spent to meet that requirement? Thank okay. you. I'll take your first question first. Um, there is, there's always a challenge on the cap and trade monies in, in the legislature. I think there's folks who would like to see more of that money spent on traditional transportation projects like road, road building or other things. The challenge there is, and I think the thing that's really in, in, in our favor, those who want to spend it on, on clean, uh, more visionary transportation investments, is that under the law, the use of that money has to achieve quantifiable greenhouse gas emission reductions. And uh, we have a much easier time demonstrating that if we're investing in clean technologies that move people, increase transit ridership, and, and reduce vehicle miles traveled from vehicles. So uh, the current state of the law in California is that uh, roughly 40% of those funds uh, go to high-speed rail, go to our transit uh, grant program, uh, and our uh, transit uh, operating program that are now articulated in the law. So there's no question there will be a continued uh, push and pull on, uh, on those funds going forward. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm confident we'll, 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 it'll look at the end a lot like it looks now. And my hope, frankly, uh, is that we find a way to get more of those revenues dedicated to the transportation sector. I think I mentioned in my comments nearly 40 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions in California come from this sector, and uh, we want to maintain the investment to clean that up uh, out of the cap-and-trade funds. Um, the second part of your question on the dis disadvantaged communities, I'd say a couple of things. Uh, under the law, AB 535 passed by uh, 
the Senate, authored by uh, Pro Tem De Leon from this area, uh, required that I, I believe it's 35% of cap and trade revenues need to be expended in disadvantaged communities. And that applies to all of the grant programs that we operate, um, both high speed rail, which if you overlay the high speed rail map and the identification of the most disadvantaged communities in California, uh, you see one speaks very, very well to the other. In other words, where we're investing in the economic development associated with constructing high-speed rail, you're getting a massive benefit into disadvantaged communities in California. Secondly, uh, on the grant program that I, that my agency operates, the capital grant program, we also have a committed uh, a commitment to invest in disadvantaged communities. And I'm very happy to report that in our first round of funding, while I think our requirement in our program is, is uh, 35%, um, our first round of funding, nearly 90% of our projects were in disadvantaged communities or resulted in a meaningful benefit to those disadvantaged communities. So I feel like we're hitting, out of, uh, we're hitting it out of the park on that. I would also just say that I think that's a, another very good reason that cap and trade dollars should continue to go to public transit improvements and cleaning up uh, public transit uh, generally and increasing ridership because it does serve so directly disadvantaged communities in California. Secretary, can I ask you a question? Sure. Yeah. Um, we're, we're all a little nervous here in the high-speed rail world of what happens after Governor Brown leaves office. Is, is there any way to set this project up that the high-speed rail project is some sort of a trust that a new governor can't come in and undo it and stop it? <laughs> That's what happened in Florida. The yeah. was ready to did, a new governor came in and shut it down. Well, look, uh, I, you know, I think the thing that we can we can do the the most to make sure that the project goes forward is um, is really move forward on on the project and the financing and the commitment of those things toward it uh, now while we can. So there's there's a robust conversation about cap and trade. Um, we want to see more of that go to modernizing transit and rail. Uh, and that includes high-speed rail, includes the regional and commuter services I mentioned earlier. That's going to be a robust conversation in Sacramento probably in 2016, this coming year. Um, I'm hopeful at the conclusion of that, though, uh, we're going to come out with more stability toward this program. Uh, that I think once you see that and once you see the economic development on the ground from the construction activities, I, I, I actually think it's harder for folks to want to turn it back. Uh, so, I also, and look, uh, I don't want to do anything, you know, just to win the gamesmanship on it. I mean, look, th this project candidly is a political football, and it has been, but the mayor said it best, you know, what's best for the state of California? What's best to achieve the mobility choices that Californians are asking for, and for us to achieve our environmental objectives that are a part of our law? that I have no obligation, I have got no choice on, on achieving. We have to achieve those. We think multimodalism is the way. We think clean multimodalism is the way. And we think that uh, an interregional uh, high-speed train service, as has been demonstrated in country after country after country, uh, will work in California. So, thank you. Thank you. OK. I I guess one quick question, we're sort of running out of time. Sure, it would probably be a quick one. Um, I wanted to know if any of you could comment on Hyperloop technologies. We've talked a lot about high-speed rail. I know when I travel around, people say, well, why don't we skip a generation and go with Hyperloop? Is that something your agency is looking at? I can comment real quick, and then I'll let the secretary comment. We, we actually were in the press commenting on that quite a bit when it came out, because we immediately got calls from numerous press. We just said that it's, it's kind of like the idea of maglev. They're not really ready for prime time yet. And if we, if we wait for it to be actually tested and ready to go, we'll, you know, we'll skip another 10 or 20 years waiting and have no good transportation. So what we've been saying is we need to get in place what's available now, off the shelf technologies, proven, tested all over the world, get it built as fast as possible in the United States so we have a great transportation system in place and then we can be looking at other technologies in the future after that. But the Hyperloop isn't even, had, they don't even have a test track yet. I mean, they could be 20, 30 years away from anything that's actually feasible, and we don't even know if it ever will be feasible. So um, we, that's why we always just say, we need to get built what's ready now, 
be using the transportation we need it today and then you know we can always experiment i don't know if secretary you want to add anything to that <laughs> i probably shouldn't but no uh you know i was just on a panel uh three days ago uh, at the milken institute with a gentleman from hyperloop and um Look, I'd say this, uh, this administration, the state uh, loves innovation. And, um, you know, I, I, we do want to encourage the continued look. I mean, you know, keep, keep working at it. Let's see, let's see what's there. But I do not view it as a clear comparison between what we have the opportunity to do right now with, uh, call it more traditional high-speed rail, uh, and what that could mean for Californians in California. Uh, and and that that other technology. So look, uh, it's it's a very political answer, I suppose. But I mean, we do support the continued look at uh, new alternatives that might be very meaningful in generations down the road. Uh, but for now, we we look look at the time we're having just getting this thing going. Yeah. So uh, so we're going to stay committed to this, but uh, we encourage the continued pursuit of other things that that might make the state better. Um. Okay, well, we'll take about a 15-minute break and then come back for the next session.